Did you get the the voice that you use? Is that from Ohio Players Funky Worm? Damn sure was. Okay. <laughs> like, damn sure was. It was like I'm, I'm gonna make a voice like that. And as soon as I heard Funky Worm, I was like, yeah, let me let me be that guy. That's where the idea came from. Yeah. Just making sure. That was oh, get it, question. baby. <laughs> Well, my story begins like this. It begins in Queensbridge, back in the day, early 70s. There was nothing but bands in the project. It was just before hip hop, so everybody was a band. The band guys were in control. You know, us as DJs, you know, we had something to look up to. Because the band guys were all over the radio, and I said to myself, maybe one day I could do something that will get on the radio too. My older brother was a DJ. He was in a group called High Fidelity Crew from Queensbridge. They were mentioned in the song, The Bridge. So they were DJs before me. He was about 10 years older. So a lot of the records that I was able to sample later on in my career came from my brother's crate because High Fidelity was the hottest and one of the first DJ groups to come out of Queensbridge along with Dr. Bob Lee. But High Fidelity was the street version. Bob Lee was the college version and they both went their separate ways. I happened to go with Dr. Bob Lee and wound up on the radio as an intern. Now there are three records that I knew that I had to incorporate into my mixing back in the day in Queensbridge. One was Funky Drummer by James Brown. You gotta think, James Brown, the rhythm of James Brown, the action and the reaction that you get when you throw it on, you know James Brown had to be one of the top ones. The other one was Dance to the Drummer's Beat by Herman Kelly. That's Dance to the Drummer's Beat. Yeah, you know that song. That was a dancer's classic. You had to play that, else you was whack. And I would say another one could be Bra by Samandi. Bra was like a, a dancer's record. You know, there was a lot of dancing before rap came out. It was like break dancing and graffiti were the first two things that I really started noticing other than DJing. Those were essential to DJ in Queensbridge back in the day. Life changed for me when I was with Dr. Bob Lee one day and I played Buffalo Gals remix. Mr. Magic heard my remix and was like, hey, my record doesn't do that. I was like, hey, it's not a Molly Mall remix, that's why. He said, who's Molly Mall? I said, me. Wow, I like that mix, can I play it on my show? We got three million listeners all the time. I was like, hey, that sounds like an option. And I became his engineer all-star, Mr. Magic's engineer all-star DJ Molly Mall with the mixing gloves that I never owned. You have to look at Sir Juice, Juice Crew. We were Mr. Magic's crew because he was Sir Juice. Uh, Mr. Magic helped me handpick each and every last one because when Big Daddy Kane first came, he had like a big afro, and but he was nice on the mic. Mr. Magic was like, look, you can't go on stage with your hair like that. Next thing you know, the high top fade was born through Big Daddy Kane. Um, so Mr. Magic had a big hand in picking everybody. He loved Biz Marquee. He loved uh, Roxanne Shante. And the first Juice Crew member that you don't know was Dimples D. But she, she went to college and didn't pursue her rap career. I could tell you a few things about Mr. Magic, but the most important thing I could tell you, he was very unruly to people. That's why, you know, the BDP beef came up because he actually dissed the whole Boogie Down production when they tried to let him hear the demo tape. He said, it's whack. Molly Mall, MC Shan, Roxanne Shante, Mr. Magic is hip hop and walked away and left them. So that's why in The Bridge Is Over and um, South Bronx, those were the people that they spoke about because Mr. Magic said that we was real hip hop. I never knew why they had beef with us until I read KRS's resume one day and he said, Mr. Magic dissed our tape at Power Play. Oh, that was that crew. I remember the day it happened. So the Juice Crew stand was this. Integrity through hip hop. We always want to be the best that were, that ever done it. So the Juice Crew guys were really good. You gotta look at Master Ace, Craig G, all the way up to Big Daddy Kane, Cool G Rap and Polo. Come on, it doesn't get much better than that. You know, the funny thing about the whole BDP battle, we never really said that Queensbridge started 
hip hop in our song. They just came from off tour. They want to tell you a little story about where they come from. But Chris said we said it, so everybody went with it. And that made me think, wow, he could make people believe what he said, something that we never said. So that made me realize how, how, how vulnerable the sheep were out there and how you could just tell anybody anything and they would believe it. But um, Juice Crew, when it first came out, I was like, it ain't gonna happen because we're the Juice Crew. We're the mighty Juice Crew. Nobody's gonna believe that guy. To my surprise, they did. You tell you the story about how it evolved in our neighborhood. We never said that hip hop started there, but it, it's weird. It could have been the end of the Juice Crew, but I had more in store. That's when I went to produce um, G Rap's album, Big Daddy Kane's album drop, and you know, I started bringing in more, more, you know, colors of the Juice Crew just to show that it wasn't the end because it really could have been the end because that was a hard blow. But I know I had to come back with Cool G Rap and Polo, boom, once again, boom, or ain't no half stepping. So, you know, I think that shut everything down on my side as being a producer. A lot of people say that the symphony, the Marley Mall Symphony, is one of the greatest posse cuts of all time. But thank you, I'll take that. But that song was basically never supposed to happen. If you look on the back of my album cover, In Control One, you see us standing in front of a Learjet. That very day after that photo shoot, we went and made that record. Kane suggested, hey, we're all together, let's go make a record. Now, everybody in that picture was supposed to be on the symphony. Some didn't show up, some did, and their careers was made. Master Ace was not supposed to be on that record, but thank God his rhymes was hot because I kept him on there, and that made his career. My whole adventure with LL Cool J really started at WBLS Studios. He came up for an interview. He was promoting Walking with a Panther, and I was like, look, there's a song on your album that I really, really like. You know, it has something to do with running over like a redneck trucker. He said, oh, jingling. I said, yeah, you should let me remix that. I have an idea. So I got the parts, the Jingling Baby remix came. That's when we started to do the Mama Said Knock You Out album. We took the synergy and energy from clubs. We was going to the tunnel every weekend, leaving the tunnel, going straight to the studio with that energy, the drunkness. I don't know how we made it home, but we did it and the album came out great. Only because we took the energy from the club, the energy from the people, and went right to the studio immediately following the club. And that's what the result was. You know, I recently heard through the grapevine that I was supposed to produce Nas's second album. That would have been great because he did come to my house immediately following the first album, a little worried because Biggie was out. And I was like, look, you know, if, if you want to come back out, you need to be on tracks like this. So I gave him a track called On The Real. The, the beat was hot, but I think what happened, you know, a lot of people kept telling him that it was hot. I think he heard, I think some of the beats or something on the radio that sounds similar. And you know, he just decided not to go with it. But I think the second album would have been crazy. Just think about that. Molly Mall, around the time I did Mama Said, working with Nas for the second album. It would have been phenomenal. Now you may look at DJ Molly Mall and say, hey, You've done it all, guys. What else do you have in store? Look, I'm not through. There's a lot of things I would love to do and more. I would love to um, score more movies. You know, I was involved with the Notorious movie, one of the few scenes. Um, I do some of the scenes for the Step Up series, some of the dance battle scenes. I do some of that on the low. Um, but I would like to, you know, maybe one day have a TV show, television show. I could I think I could rock a crowd. One day I'll retire, go live in my house in Japan with my feet up in the clouds. That's, that's what I'm going to do. It's, it's a, lot, a lot of things I would like to do, but that's it.